Welcome to this video. Today we're going to be looking at the human heart. Now the heart is a hollow muscular organ. It's located in the thoracic cavity and it's roughly where my fist is in relationship to this skeleton. Central but slightly towards the left hand side of the thoracic cavity. We can use this model to help understand the position of the heart in the chest. So here we see the, uh, the ribs of the thoracic cavity. And these come out. And here we see the heart here. In the chest, slightly towards the left. We'll look at what these main structures are in relation to the heart later on in the video. But for now, just let's notice the, the position of the heart. Now this is a CT scan showing the heart and thoracic cavity and you can see the level that this section is taken at from this small picture here. And here we can see the vertebrae, the thoracic vertebrae, the sternum, ribs round about the outside. And this area, this lighter coloured area in the middle is the heart and this darker coloured, these darker coloured areas round here are the lungs. And here we have a more traditional x-ray, which you're probably used to seeing. Again, we have the right lung field, the left lung field, and this area in the middle referred to as the cardiac shadow and represents the position of the heart. Now, the heart is a muscular pump. It pumps blood. And I'm going to try and make a simple muscular pump with my hands now. Well, there we are. I'm pumping water out of the bowl, not in a very coordinated way, but you get the idea, I think, using muscular activity to generate a pumping action. Now, the heart is a much better pump than that. It's a very sophisticated pump. And let's now look at how it's constructed and relate that construction to the way it works. Now, the first part of this video, we're going to look at the heart. But later on in the video, we're looking at the vascular system as well. So what we're actually looking at is the cardiovascular system. And the cardiovascular system refers to the heart and the circulatory system which circulates blood round about the body. What we're going to do now is build up a diagram of the heart to try and explain how it works. Now if you're used to working through other videos in this series, you'll know that it's necessary for you to build up the diagram with me as I build it up on the paper. So let's start building up a diagram of the heart. Now remember in anatomy, whenever you're looking at anatomy, this is always the left side and this is the right side here. So let's just put notes there to remind ourselves. That's the left side, that's the right side. I'm sure you can manage to draw something like that. Now, this represents the wall of the left ventricle, which is quite thick. And the wall of the right ventricle is thinner. And I'm deliberately drawing this as a thinner wall. Now, the heart contains valves. There's some valves in the middle here, which point up this way, like this. And some on the other side like that valves pointing up the way. And on the same level as the valves pointing up the way, there's some valves pointing down the way as well like this. Now leaving this valve here on the left side is a major blood vessel which carries blood away from the heart.
On this side, there's a large vessel carrying blood away from the heart, which rapidly divides into two other vessels. On this side, I'm going to draw one vessel carrying blood into this chamber here. Actually, in fact, there's four vessels carrying blood into that chamber, but that simplifies it a bit. And carrying blood into this chamber, there are two large vessels. So your first aim is to produce a diagram like that, because we're going to work on that in a minute. OK, if you've got a diagram like that, what we're going to try and do now is put some labels on it. Now, remember that we're trying to draw a three-dimensional structure in two dimensions. So remember, this is always in three dimensions. If you're going to understand basic cardiac anatomy and physiology, I think you need to learn the following terms. So let's put some labels on it now. Now, these top chambers here are the left and the right atrium. So that is the left atrium. And on the other side, we have the right atrium. They are the top chambers of the heart. Now the lower chambers are larger chambers and they're referred to as ventricles. Again, you've got to try and think that this is a three-dimensional chamber. And this chamber here is the left ventricle. Chamber on the other side, the lower chamber, is the right ventricle. So, left and right atrium, left and right ventricle. Now, between the left atrium and the left ventricle, there's a valve. We've got a valve drawn here. This valve is referred to as the mitral valve. So the mitral valve is located between the left atria and the left ventricle. Now in some books you will see this valve referred to as the bicuspid valve. But the correct way to refer to it is the mitral valve. Dividing the right atria and the right ventricle, again, we have a valve here. This valve, and this valve is called the tricuspid valve. So the tricuspid valve dividing the right atria and the right ventricle. Now this large vessel here leaving the left ventricle, is the vessel which carries blood round about the systemic circulation or round about the body, to the brain, to the liver, to the feet, to everywhere except the lungs, in fact. And this large vessel is referred to as the aorta. So the aorta is the large vessel leaving the left ventricle. Leaving the right ventricle, we have another large vessel. As we said, it rapidly divides into two vessels. And this large vessel is the pulmonary artery. The pulmonary artery divides into two. The left pulmonary artery carrying blood to the left lung. The right pulmonary artery 
carrying blood to the right lung, so the pulmonary artery, leaving the right ventricle of the heart. Now we've noticed that between the left ventricle and the aorta there is a valve, and this valve is referred to as the aortic valve. So the aortic valve separates the left ventricle from the aorta. Again, in some old-fashioned books you'll find this referred to as the aortic semilunar valve. This is because they have the appearance of half moons, or some people thought they did. But the correct way to refer to this valve now is simply as the aortic valve. Now, notice again, there is a valve between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. This valve here. And because it guards the entrance to the pulmonary artery, it is called the pulmonary valve. So the pulmonary valve between the right ventricle and the pulmonary artery. Again, in some older books, you might find that referred to as the pulmonary arterial semilunar valve, but the correct name is the pulmonary valve. Now these valves here are actually supported. There is tenderness cords made of very strong connective tissue attached to these valves. And it's the same on this side as well. This is to stop the valves opening in the other direction that they're not supposed to open in. And these tenderness cords are attached onto the inner ventricular wall via muscles, special muscles. Now these muscles are referred to as papillary muscles. So papillary muscles attaching these tenderness cords which hold the valves in place to the ventricular wall. And the tenderness cords themselves are referred to by the Latin name of cordae tendinae. Cordae tendinae. So what we've done is draw a heart and looked at the basic components of it. Now I'm only going to put three more things on this diagram and then I'll leave you to learn it. First of all, Lining the inside of the heart, there is an inner layer, it lines all of the inside of the ventricles, the atria and the valves and it's referred to as the endocardium. So the endocardium, smooth layer lining the inside of the heart. Because it's a smooth layer, it's made of squamous epithelium. Flat-shaped, smooth cells to allow the blood to flow over the inside surface of the heart easily. 
Now the middle layer of the heart, by far the thickest layer, of course this extends all around the wall. This, we're describing the main component of the heart wall now. And also in the middle part. Now this is the heart muscle. We said the, muscle, the heart is a, is a pump. It needs muscle tissue to generate the energy for the pumping action. And this middle layer is referred to as the myocardium. The myo, myo means muscle. Cardium to do with the heart, literally the heart muscle. And that's made out of cardiac muscle tissue. Specialised muscle tissue found in the myocardium and nowhere else in the body. Final layer of the heart we're going to consider, round about the outside of the heart, there's a layer of tough fibrous tissue going around the outside of the heart. This tough fibrous tissue protects the heart from damage and also stops it from overexpanding, therefore being damaged. And because it goes around the outside of the heart, it goes around the perimeter of the heart, we refer to it as the pericardium. So the outside layer, the pericardium. And the pericardium is made of a fibrous tissue, tough fibrous tissue. Tough fibrous tissue around, forming a sac round about the heart to protect the heart from damage. Now, this diagram and these terms describe the basic anatomy of the heart. It's necessary to learn these so that you can understand how the heart works. Now here we've got a three-dimensional model of the heart, so we can try and relate what we've just looked at in two dimensions to something which is nearer the three-dimensional reality. So we've got a three-dimensional structure here. Now at the back here, we've got the esophagus, and this is the trachea here at the back of the heart. Now here, this major vessel leaving the left atria is the aorta, and you can already see that there's branches here, of arterial branches branching off the aorta, carrying blood to different parts of the body. This structure here represents the pulmonary artery. Turning round, looking to the right-hand side of the heart now, here we have the superior vena cava, and underneath here, going into the right atria from underneath, the inferior vena cava. And if I open up now the right atria, I think we can probably see this. We can see here the uh, superior vena cava bringing blood down into this space here, which is the right atria. And just there you can see the opening of the inferior vena cava. Now, here's the tricuspid valve open in this model going through there, and there I'm putting my finger into the right ventricle. And again, if we open the right ventricle, we can see the right ventricle, and we can see the 
tricuspid valve. Here we can see some papillary muscles. All this, of course, lined with endocardium. Now, part I didn't put on the diagram, actually, the middle part here is the septum that divides the two halves of the heart, but we'll look at that later on. Now opening the um, left atria, and we can see coming into the left atria there's the representation of some pulmonary veins, the four pulmonary veins, emptying blood into the left atria. And again, we can see here on the left side the entrance from the left atria through into the left ventricle through there. Again, now I can open the left ventricle up, and here we see the bicuspid valve, or the mitral valve, to give it its correct term. Here we see the left ventricular myocardium, left ventricle, more papillary muscles in there. So we can see the heart now composed of four chambers, left atria, right atria, left ventricle, right ventricle. So here we have a heart that we can show a few features on, the outside of the heart here. In life would be covered by the fibrous pericardium. The actual glistening smooth layer you can see there actually lining the outside of the heart is sometimes referred to as the epicardium between, or, 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 or sometimes it's referred to as the visceral pericardium. It's an outside very thin layer, but normally there would have been the um, tough fibrous pericardium over the top there. This heart's already been opened. I think here we can see the uh, thick myocardial muscle and again on this side thick myocardial muscle. Let's start open this a little further now. And there we can see I think that white structure, one of the chordae tendoni and again tendinous some little clot there. Again some tendinous cords in there supporting the bottom of this valve here, one of the atrioventricular valves. Valvular tissue there and the tendinous cord supporting it. Again we can see structures inside the ventricle there, for example we can see a papillary muscle just in there. And lining this which would have been the inside chamber of the heart the glistening, smooth, very, that feels very smooth to the touch, the endocardium to allow the blood to flow over the heart nice and smoothly. So endocardium, thick uh, myocardial muscle. And you can see how muscular the, the whole structure is. The heart is a very muscular pumping organ. So, we've examined the basic structure of the heart. Now what I'd like to do now is show the way the heart works and to illustrate the way the blood flows through the heart. Now first of all, good practice, and I invite you to draw another basic diagram of the heart again, but this time we'll use it for a different purpose. left ventricular wall, right ventricular wall. Actually, when we were passing here, I think I'll name this bit in the middle now. That's called the septum. The first diagram was getting a bit full, so we've la labelled it on this one, the middle part, the septum. Valves in the middle, pointing up the way. This one's the aortic valve, that one's the pulmonary valve. Atrioventricular valves pointing down the way, mitral valve, tricuspid valve, 
Of course, they were, these would be connected to tendinous cords, the cord I tendini and the papillary muscles. But I'm going to leave this off on this diagram for simplicity. Aorta. Pulmonary artery. Pulmonary vein. As I mentioned before, there's actually four pulmonary veins in humans. I've only drawn one to keep the diagram simple. Inferior vena cava. Superior vena cava. There we are. As we've seen, this isn't totally the way it's laid out in, in uh, life, but it is accurate, physiologically accurate. Now, <clears throat> the left-hand side of the heart, this side of the heart, is responsible for pumping blood into the aorta. And the aorta takes blood all around the body. And blood is received via these four pulmonary veins from the lungs. And when the blood comes back from the lungs, it's going to be oxygenated. Because the reason that blood is pumped to the lungs is to be oxygenated. So oxygenated blood arrives back from the lungs via the four pulmonary veins and enters, clecks in the left atria. Now when the blood is oxygenated, it's bright red, so we normally use a, bri a, a bright red pen to, to represent the oxygenated blood. So oxygenated blood arriving back from the lungs via the pulmonary veins. Some of this blood goes into the ventricle if the valves are open, but if the ventricle is contracting, the blood clecks in the atria. Now the first thing that happens is that the atrial muscle will contract. And when the atrial muscle contracts, that's going to increase the pressure of the blood in this atria. So the pressure of the blood is increased. Now notice the atrioventricular valve is pointing down the way. So it will open down the way, so blood can go from the atria down into the ventricle. But the cordae tendini will not let it do that. It won't open up the way. That's what a valve is. That valve is. It's a structure that facilitates a one-way flow. So the atrioventricular valve, in this case the mitral valve, will open down the way, and it will open down the way when the pressure of the blood above it in the atria increases. The pressure of the blood in the atria will increase when the atrial muscle contracts. So the atrial muscle contracts, the pressure of the blood in the atria increases, and that opens the valve. That means blood is free to flow from the atria down into the ventricles. So flow of blood from the atria down into the ventricles through the mitral valve, meaning the ventricle can fill up with blood. Bright red, oxygenated blood. Now the next thing that happens is that the ventricular muscle the ventricular myocardium contracts. When the ventricular myocardium contracts, that's going to pressurise the blood in the left ventricle. Now when that happens, two things will happen as a consequence. The first, because the pressure is increasing, means that this valve will be shut by the increased pressure of the blood underneath it. So there'll be pressure from beneath, closing the atrioventricular valve. So it will shut. It will shut like that, but not, not open up the other way, it shuts. So the atria contracts, the valve opens, the ventricle contracts, and that closes the valve. So the valves don't move themselves, the, valve just, the valves just move in response to pressure changes above and below them. So the atrioventricular valve contracts. Now that's good because it means the blood cannot be ejected from the ventricle back into the atria. 
There'd be no point in that because if blood kept going from the atria to the ventricle and back again, we wouldn't have a circulatory system. So the closure of the atrioventricular valve prevents the backflow of blood into the atria. But at the same time, do you notice on the diagram that we drew the aortic valve pointing up the way? So when the pressure increases in the ventricle below the aortic valve, the aortic valve can open. So at the same time as the pressure of the blood closes the atrioventricular valve, it also opens the aortic valve to let the blood out through into the aorta. So when the ventricle contracts, the blood is ejected out through the aortic valve into the aorta where it can circulate all round about the body. Now when the blood is circulated round about the body, it gives up its oxygen to the tissues of the body. That means the blood in the main veins in the body is deoxygenated. And traditionally, we, traditionally we draw that as, as blue. Just, it's not really blue, of course. It's actually dark red. But we draw it as blue just to um, differentiate it from the oxygenated blood. So deoxygenated blood is returning from the top part of the body via the superior vena cava, from the bottom part of the body via the inferior vena cava. So blood draining back here and here into the atria. And the atria will fill up with deoxygenated blood. And again, the same thing happens. When the atrial muscle contracts, that increases the pressure in the atria. That causes opening of the atrioventricular valve on the right side, which is referred to as the tricuspid valve. That means that the blood will go through into the right ventricle. The right ventricle will fill up with blood. Next thing that happens is that there's contraction of the right ventricle. Contraction of the right ventricle increases the pressure of the blood in the right ventricle. That closes the tricuspid valve that way, that one closes. The valve here, the pulmonary valve, is set that way, so that opens. So at the same time, there is closure of the atrioventricular valve. There is opening of the pulmonary valve. That means the blood is ejected into the pulmonary artery. From there, some of the blood goes to the left lung and some goes to the right lung. So this diagram describes the flow of blood through the heart, the contraction of the atria, followed by the contraction of the ventricles, channeling blood round the heart and pumping it out via the arterial system. Now notice that the left side of the heart is pumping blood to all of the body except the lungs. So the right-hand side of the heart is often referred to as the body pump. The left hand side, the, sorry, the right hand side of the heart, so the left hand side of the heart is the body pump. The right hand side of the heart is pumping blood only to the lungs. So it's sometimes referred to as the lung pump. And this explains why the ventricular myocardium is thicker on the left side than it is on the right side. Because the lungs are located in the thoracic cavity, the heart does not have as far to pump the blood so it doesn't need to generate as high a pressure. So you need more muscle to generate a higher pressure on the left side to pump the blood all the way around the body. So you need thicker myocardium, more muscle. On the right side, because the blood does not have to go so far, it just goes to the lungs. That means you need a lower pressure to perfuse the lungs to get the blood to go through the lungs. So the right ventricular myocardium is thinner. And the right side of the heart is referred to sometimes as the lung pump. So the left side, the body pump. The right side, the lung pump. And of course, what I haven't mentioned yet is both atria contract at the same time. 
when I ran through the sequence, you might have got the impression that that one contracted and that contracted. That's not at all the case. Both atria contract at the same time and both ventricles contract at the same time to give a coordinated cardiac output. 